Okay, great. Well, guys, uh, I imagine some of you know Bob, know me, but I might have some new guys. We have not chance to look at all your names here. Uh, but this is a new webinar. So let me first introduce Bob, as usual. Uh, Bob Johnson, who is with us, has been with us almost a year now doing webinars, no, Bob? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. Is, is our, whoop, okay, good. Uh, by the way, uh, I hope you all guys are okay, you know, in this crazy COVID-19 pandemic and uh, you are recovering and things. Let's pray God get better. Okay, so Bob, uh, is our guest speaker and has over 30 years of experience in the EX world. He's also a Comp EX instructor as well as an ICEX Comp PC scheme instructor and is an inspector, a US UL STP committee member. And he runs a company that um, sources ICEX, which you know, deals with EX products. So he's very, very well qualified to run this webinar today. And we said we'll talk about the IC 60079 and 879 standards. We we'll review them and discuss a little bit about them. And at the same time, we'll take your question. The way you can talk to us is through the question and answer box. That's the only way you can talk to us. Uh, somebody's claiming there's no video, but the video is on. You have to look at your setting. So before we run, let me give you first briefly a brief introduction about GMI. So who we are, we are GM International, design engineer manufacturers a, a complete range of IS and C certified devices for most automation packages, such as DCS, fire and gas, BMS, and so on, in all the industrial sector from oil and gas to food and bath. We have over 40 years of experience, and we are proud to make our product 100% in our state-of-the-art facility near Milan, Italy. On the other end, we are a global player with presence around the world. Bob next, and uh, because we make safety product, we take special care in manufacturing them using state-of-the-art technologies. We have full product traceability. We do 100% testing on all of our product. We have a very highly automated manufacturing process. We are, of course, ROS and REACH compliant. We have SC3 certification, UV SIL3 certification for our manufacturing plant. Of course, we have ISO 9000 2015, and we do take special care because we care. Making safety product, we care for the, you know, for our customer, for the world we live in. Next, Bob. And these are the product we manufacture: IS barrier, safety relays, isolator, also seal certified. We make power supply, EX and seal certified. We have multiplexer, temperature multiplexer, digital multiplexer. We have heart multiplexers. We make a serious automation board designed to interface with the most, most of the system out there. We have a line of SPD or search protection device, some loop indicators, and we run a division that does training and services in the EX and seal functional safety domain. We have about 10 offices around the world and many distributors. We are about 200 people. We run a lot of courses between the SEAL courses and the EX courses. You can see them online. Now we do them online. You used to do them in presence. Now they're all online, but they are, there's a schedule in our, in our website. And we have thousands of installations all around the continents. Some of our customers from the system vendors, say from ABB to Yokogawa, many PCs, we do a lot of OEMs, so uh, to whom we sell our product and install them on their compressors, uh, skis, well at packages and so on. And of course we are in the AVL of many end users. Well, I believe uh, Bob, next, this, this is it. This is uh, <laughs> the, in, the start of our webinar. As I said, you can post questions through the question and answer box, we will try to answer them along or at the end of the webinar. We also have prepared a quick presentation with some answer to the question you posed during the registration process. Okay, Bob, it's all yours. If I disappear, I'm just here. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Paolo. And, uh, thank you, Bob. and thank you very much, everybody, for participating uh, this morning, this evening. Uh, 
I apologize if I'm a little bit groggy. It is midnight here in Houston, so I'm I'm uh, I'm not necessarily the sharpest right now, but um, hopefully we'll we'll get through this and and share with you some really good information. So, and this is a, a question that does come up a lot: is people want to know a little bit more about the standards, where they've come from, what they cover, how we use them, um, and many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with the six zero zero. 79 standards, which we'll talk about. We're also going to talk a little bit about, as Paulo mentioned, the 80079 standards, which are the, uh, they, there's a couple of them actually that deal with mechanical equipment for use in hazardous locations, as well as a, a new quality standard, actually a addition to that's just recently come out. So we'll talk about this because a lot of times people look at the standards and they get a little bit confused as to, depending on the role and responsibility that you have, which standards are really important for you to understand. And so that's kind of why I wanted to put this together. So where do the IEC standards come from? Well, they're, they're developed by the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC. And within the IEC, they have a bunch of different uh, various technical committees that work on different standards, sets of standards, if you will, uh, covering all different kinds of areas in the electrotechnical field, anything from solar panels to uh, high voltage cables to you name it, all different kinds of things. So the committee that really works on the, the 60079 standards and, and as well as the mechanical standards is what is called the Technical Committee 31. That's TC31. So sometimes you might hear TC31. So this technical committee is made up of 41 participating countries. Every country that's a member of the IEC, um, uh, basically for the most part, are, are members. And each country selects an individual to represent their country. And these are typically, um, here in the United States, we have the gentleman actually from DNVGL. He's our committee chairperson. And actually, he's the committee chairperson of TC31, but he's the U.S. representative to TC31. But it is truly a global organization made up of technical advisors uh, representing various standard writing committees from all over the world. So it is a, a very broad-based broad organization, um, and they basically meet and they come up with updates to the standards, and that's where they come from, if you will. So what are the standards for EX? And this is not, I've actually just put together two slides. This isn't all of the relevant standards that we need to be aware of, but these are the main ones. This is probably about 80% of the IEC standards for hazardous location, this slide and the next slide. And usually one of the questions that people will always ask is that if, if I'm an individual that's maybe a designer, uh, what standards within the 60079 set of standards do I really need to be familiar with? Uh, on the other hand, if I'm a manufacturer of EX equipment, I need to know a little bit more. And so there's, there's different standards to kind of address different things that you need to know with regards to everything within the EX. So if we kind of go through this list, and I put over on the right-hand side either an M, a D, or an I. So if I'm a manufacturer um, using as a reference that 60079-0, the general requirements, well, guess what? Everybody should understand that standard. And if there's probably one of the standards, if you can only get one of these standards, that's probably one of the most important ones to get because that tells us a lot of the general rules and regulations that is really referenced throughout the series of standards. So if I'm a manufacturer, I need to know it. If I'm a designer uh, applying EX equipment, I certainly need to know a lot of information out of there. And certainly am I involved in installation and maintenance? Certainly I need to know that information as well. As we move through this list, you'll see that a lot of them I've only referenced M and, and that's really geared towards manufacturing. So for example, if we use the second one on there, the 60079-1 standard, that deals with the design of flame-proof equipment. Now, if we read that standard and we go through it, it'll tell us what it takes to build, in effect, a flame-proof enclosure. 
Uh, it'll talk about the pressure ratings. It'll talk about things like the maximum experimental safe gap. It'll tell us the differences between a flange joint and a spigot joint and a threaded joint and the tolerances that need to be built into this particular product. Now, if I'm a designer <clears throat> and I'm designing a system, if you will, I'm not designing necessarily a flame-proof panel, but I'm, I'm applying the use of a flame-proof product into my system, I don't necessarily need to know the nitty gritty of everything that's in 60079-1. I just need to understand that flame-proof is a protection concept and I need to make sure that the products that I'm using is compliant with that standard. So as we go through some of these standards, important to understand, again, don't get lost in the weeds because there's so many different ones. Let's focus on the ones that's really relevant to our roles and our responsibilities. So as we go down this list, pressurization, that's another protection concept. Again, manufacturer, powder filling, another protection concept, that's a manufacturer, so forth and so on. When we get down to intrinsic safety, you'll see something in there called SC31G. This is a subcommittee that resides within TC31 that is specifically addresses intrinsic safety. So this is part of TC31, but it's a subgroup within TC31 that comes up with the details on the standard on intrinsic safety. The same thing holds true for area classifications. Now, when we get into area classification, notice that it's really more for the designers and applying the EX equipment into a facility. Certainly installation and maintenance, it's important, but it's really important for the designers that they're applying, that they understand the fundamentals of area classification. This is also another subcommittee within TC31, the SC31J that's responsible for those two standards, as well as the 60079-14, which is our design, install, and selection. That standard is the standard that is basically the, the foundation for all of the competency programs, if you will, either the COMPEX program or the IECEX Certificate of Personnel Competency program. A lot of what is actually taught in the class and the knowledge that you would gain would be coming straight out of 60079-14. Then as we continue on again, end protection, so forth and so on, we get into inspections. Again, the reason why I put down manufacturers should be relevant or should understand the inspection standard is that if I'm manufacturing a product, it's very good to understand the inspection requirements as well as the maintenance requirements. Because if I'm building a product, I should at least also provide my installation and operation maintenance manual as well as whatever inspection that needs to be done to make sure that this product is in good shape for years to come. And then as we get down at the bottom of this page, DAS 19, that's a fairly new one, the repair and overhaul. So if we say, for example, we have a motor that's in service and we need to get this uh, repaired, we don't wanna buy a brand new EX large motor, there's actually a repair and overhaul standard. So some people are not familiar with that, but that's out there as well. As we go along to this next page, again, I'm not really gonna go through all of these, but I just wanna make you aware that these are some of the other IEC standards that are all part of the 60079 series. You'll see as we go down there, I think on the fifth one down, you'll see an IEC TS. That's a technical specification. There are what is called TRs and TSs that are developed by the IEC. There's standards, but there's also technical specifications. A technical specification <clears throat> generally is a first draft that may at some particular point in time become a standard, but maybe it was only developed by the subcommittee and it wasn't brought out to the entire IEC to vote on, but it was an important topic that was felt at least to bring this information out into the marketplace. So for example, the IEC TS 60079-32.2 is a guidance for electrostatic hazards. So you'll see some other TSs in there as well, process sealing, control of potential ignition sources, equipment assemblies, the dash 46, 
That's a pretty new one. And that's where we start talking about a complete SCID package, certification of a package of EX equipment. As we get down, now we see that we find some joint ISO IEC standards. The 20-1 and the 20-2 deal with characteristics of gases and dust. Those two standards actually took the place of the legacy 60079-20-1 and 20-2. They've now been adopted as an ISO standard. And um, so anyway, those have been renamed and they're basically, it's the same information that what we would have found in the old legacy standards. The 80079-34 has to deal with quality for a manufacturer of EX equipment. The 36 and 37, those are the new mechanical standards that we're going to talk a little bit later on. And then lastly, we've got a couple new ones that are coming out in the pipeline. The dash 44, which is a personal competency. That's probably going to be published as a technical specification. And then also, finally, another technical specification for internal combustion engines. So those are two technical specifications that are being worked on right now within the technical TC31. So this, these two slides will at least give you an indication of if I'm involved in the EX process, either as a manufacturer, a user, a designer, an installer, at least you have a better understanding, hopefully, to understand which are the real relevant standards that I need to understand. So <clears throat> this is always a question that comes up as well. What are the differences between IEC standards and Euronorm standards, EN standards? So Euronorm standards are actually published and developed by an organization called Senelec. Senelec is based in Brussels. And these are known as EN standards. Now, here's the thing. The EN standard and Senelec is actually members of Senelec are also part of that TC31 committee. So what happens actually is that when it actually goes to vote within the TC31 or within the IEC, members of Senelec also have the opportunity to vote on it as well. And generally speaking, what happens is that once it gets developed as an IEC standard and it's published as an IEC standard, Senelec will then take that exact same standard and publish it as an EN standard. So the main thrust, the main details of an IEC standard, the technical details of an IEC standard versus an EN standard are virtually identical. Now, once they become an EN standard, then they get adopted by every one of the European countries. So in the case of the UK, um, now it gets known as a BS EN 60079 standard. And that will hold true for various countries throughout Europe. Italy has their set, Germany has their set, Sweden has their set, Spain has their set, but they're all based upon the 60079 set of standards. So the important thing is to note about that is that if we understand the base standard, the IEC standard, then generally speaking, the EN standard is again going to be pretty much the same. So what are the differences? Well, in reality, um, they are pretty much the same from a technical standpoint. However, within the EN standards, there will be some annexes that will be added to the Euro norms. And this is typically known as Annex ZA. So in the Annex, what there will be, there will be things that will be referenced that maybe instead of an IEC standard, it'll say reference the equivalent EN standard. And when it comes to things like the ATEX directive, which is mandatory within the European Union, it'll have verbiage and language talking about compliance to the ATEX directive, as well as markings and all that other good stuff. But in general, the main text of the technical standard is identical to the IEC. So when I'm taking a product to actually get it certified, um, when I go to get a product certified, a flame-proof product that's built to an IEC standard and it's built to an EN standard, if it's the same standard, it will be basically the same product. It'll be marked differently, 
but and it doesn't mean that we can use an IEC product that's only marked IEC in a European market or vice versa, but the product will basically be identical. And the difference, Bob, would be that you need two certificates, so two costs. <laughs> you would have two certificates, that's correct. Okay, great, Bob. Uh, I launched a poll for you guys to see if you are with us. So what 6079 standard will apply to every EX certified electrical product? Uh, Bob, you know, it's the first time we run this webinar. It's the first time I listen in and uh, wow, very informative, very well laid out. All these standards, uh, some of whom I did not know they even exist, some of which I do not know. Well, and, and, uh, thank you, Bob, you know, great job. Uh, yeah, well, because, and, uh, well, and that's one thing people, people get overwhelmed. Uh, you can go to the IEC web store and you can go through the 60079 standards. You can say, hey, I want to buy the entire package. Exactly. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I think it's about 7,000 Swiss francs it's to expensive. buy the entire package, right? And you might find that, you know what, wait a minute, I really, I'm not in the gas detector business. Well, I don't need a copy of that particular standard and I'm not gonna be using ventilation for analyzer shelters. So I don't need that standard, but what are the standards that I really need to know? And so that's that was the intent of putting those couple slides together. But we're gonna All talk- All right, about guys, that. let me end this polling show you uh, the result. Most of you answer correctly, which was 60079-0, you know, the base standard, everyone should know, and should read, and should buy, as Bob just mentioned. Yep, yep. That's the important thing to understand. The dash zero, that's the general requirements. So pretty much any protection concept, any of the design, all of the various details within all of the other IEC standards, all the other 60079 standards, the, the, the reference is gonna be starting off in 60079-0. So what I tell people, if you could only buy one standard, well, first off, if I was to only buy one standard, I would buy the Dash 14 standard because that's what I use from a design standpoint, but you also need to know what's in Dash zero because that, there's a lot of good information in there as well. Okay, so let's close okay. that. Let's continue on. All right. So I mentioned I mentioned there's a little bit difference between something that is certified to an IEC standard or built to an IEC standard and something that's built to a European EN standard. So here's an example of a nameplate that shows you at the very top. You can see that's your EN standard marking or what we would commonly refer to as your ATEX marking string. Down in the bottom, what you see, you see an IEC standard marking. And if we notice the, this, the marking strings actually for the portion that's down there under the IEC versus the portion that's there, part of the highlighted is actually identical. Where we say EXDB, 2B plus H2, T5, GB, we, say, we see that same information in the top string. But we also see some further information that's a requirement under the ATEX directive. So that type of information would be located in the annex that you would find in the BSEN version or any of the European country versions, you're gonna find information about, again, marking to the ATEX directive. That is not part of the IEC standard. So that's an example of a product that went through certification. And in this case, it went to one organization, SESI, that's both a notified body under the ATEX directive, as well as an IEC EX certifying body under the IEC EX scheme. And they basically did one test and they were able to achieve and get approvals both under ATEX and IEC EX. So if you're a manufacturer and you're thinking about building a product and say if you're in the United States and you wanna get into the European market well, it would make sense to, if you're going to go and do that, you might as well go ahead and try to get your IEC EX as well, because it's basically the same technical testing on the product that you would be doing under the ATEX directive. So there are some differences, however, <clears throat> between certain passages within the IEC standards 
and maybe what might be seen in national annexes. So this was a big thing. And if any of you are involved in selection of cable glands, this is really important for you to understand. So there was a revision in the IEC 60079-14 from 2013 with regards to the cable gland selection, uh, specifically for EXD barrier or not barrier glands going into flame proof products. And what happened with this is that once the IEC came out with this, again, each country within Europe was to adopt it as an EN standard, and in the case of the UK, as a BSEN standard. Well, what they ended up doing in the UK, they disagreed very strongly with the change with regards to the selection of cable glands, and they put in what was called a national annex in the UK for selection of cable glands for flame-proof products. And basically what they are saying is that they said, we don't agree with the latest version of the IEC for selection of barrier glands. We want you to use the previous selection chart that was in effect from 2007. Now, why is this important? Well, if you have a client in which you're building something for, and say it's going into the UK, and somebody says, hey, uh, select some cable glands for this application. What would you want to follow? Would you want to follow the IEC version or would you want to follow the EN, BSEN version? You would want to follow the BSEN version and then you would want to look at the national annex and make a determination of whether or not you need to select a barrier gland based upon those parameters. And what I did here on these next slides is basically showing you the difference. On the left-hand side is a selection of glands from the previous version from 2007, based upon a couple of different examples. So what we have in effect on those three glands that you see, that's the old flowchart methodology. These were non-barrier glands, assuming non-filled uh, non or filled cables, hygroscopic fillers, round, compact, and everything else. When we look over on the right-hand side, the new IEC standard says we base it upon the length of cable, and that's really the important determining factor. And in effect, basically, the new standard says if it's less than three meters, three meters or less, we need to use a barrier gland. If it's just over three meters or longer, we do not require a barrier gland. So this is one example that shows you that on the left-hand side, based upon the IEC standard, we wouldn't require a barrier gland, or actually that's the old IEC standard, and actually that would be part of the UK National Annex. On the right-hand side is based upon the new standard. So you wanna make sure it's important if you're building, assembling, or doing any of this work to make sure you select the appropriate glands, follow the right standard. When we look at this other slide, Again, using the old flow chart from 2007 or the National Annex from the UK version, we see that we're using barrier glands for those three applications. On the right-hand side, we're finding out that no, we don't need to use barrier glands. So again, the important point to note is it's based upon the new IEC standard, it's a cable length issue. Remember three meters or longer. If it's three meters or longer, we do not require a barrier gland. Generally, if it's less than three meters going into a flame-proof box, we do require a barrier gland. Well, this come to... So this leads into... And this a important then, because you just gave the answer, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> what is the length of cable distance is reference to 079, 14, 2013? where barrier gland must be used terminating into EXD enclosure. Less than three meters, more than three meters, less than five meters or more than five meters. If I got it correctly, you just gave the answer a moment ago. Interesting, you know, these uh, small differences in the standards uh, make a big difference, you know, when you're trying to it, apply, because you do, sometimes you don't know. And in this know. case, I imagine you cannot build a gland that suits both standards, or can you not? 
you can you can use a barrier a barrier you can always use a barrier gland for both applications ah, okay but, but you can avoid using a better gland if you are falling yeah. there right so the the issue is with barrier glands is that they cost more and they take longer to install so people try to shy away from them we don't want to use them if we don't need to but if you're confused use a barrier gland for well, EXT. you know, I have to say, Bob, our guests are not listening very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you the result. Uh, very different answers. All of them been answered. And, so, uh, so, so the correct, what, what answer is, correct answer, Bob? Yeah, the correct answer is, um, what is the length of cable with reference where barry glands must be used when terminating? It's three meters or less. So the answer would be B. B. So and, you know, for the majority of our guests answer correctly, but we have some other, you know. Okay, right. no problem. By the way, I would have answered A. I don't know why. I wasn't <laughs> listening carefully. Well, if, okay. if the we had a couple of questions, but uh, I don't know if you want to go on. Uh, you you mentioned three C somewhere. Or Oh, what is 3C? Yeah, so what 3C has to deal with is dust hazards, uh, which we haven't really talked about. Although actually, you know what, I think we can go back and take a look. When we see this label, I think you might see it here. The 3C. Ah, uh, yeah, 3C is on the EXTB 3C. Yeah, so that deals with uh, conductive dust. So that's not gas, that's dust. Okay. Uh, the other question was, besides the cable length, does the volume for EXD will be affect the selection of the barrier gland as well? Yes, it would based upon the old flow chart. However, based upon the new selection chart, it does not. Um, so it's important to understand which, which standard we're using with regards to selection of barrier glands. Yeah. Great, Bob. Absolutely. And, and somebody asked a little bit about the difference between the cost of a barrier gland and the non-barrier gland, or what's the difference? Um, basically, the, the non-barrier gland will have a packing material, um, a liquid or a compound or a putty. So there's two examples of a barrier gland versus a non-barrier gland. Uh, let's see if I can actually highlight this here. So that's your compound. That's like a cement type material that hardens up. It becomes a permanent. This actually is a diaphragm seal that is a rubber seal that provides a flame proof integrity, but it's not a permanent seal, if you will. So that's an example of a barrier gland. That's an example of a non-barrier gland. Both of them, however, are certified EXD and can be used direct entry into flame proof boxes. So. Moving on. So this is a question that sometimes gets asked, how long are the standards valid within the IEC? So because if you, if you go back to the, those slides, if you notice that those standards are published on diff in different years, they get evaluated. Um, usually it's about a four to seven year type time frame, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. But basically, that's usually about the time frame when a standard gets updated, if you will. So if I'm a manufacturer, which standard do I use? Well, this, the, basically, in the, in the IEC EX COC, it says that you should be using the current standard or no more than one edition prior. Because there is, if you have a product, and we'll show this in a minute, you might have some products that have different protection concepts built in, some of those protection concepts, you might be doing that whole process and all of a sudden a new standard comes out. Well, does that mean you have to redo this whole process? Not necessarily. So um, there will be information also on the IEC website that'll show you that when those standards have been reconfirmed, if they've been withdrawn, replaced or amended, and we'll also have a stability date for each one of those standards. Under the EN, under CENELEC, the European commissions, they have dates in which they become into effect as well at what point they become non-conformant. So if we look at that first line, 
the legislation, the reference A, 24, uh, 2014, 34 EU, that's our ATEX directive. The reference standard in that case was the EN 600-0 from 2012 plus the annex from 2013. Notice that the date of presumption of conformity was in 2016, but on the right-hand side, notice the date of withdrawal, the end of presumption of conformity is 7-6 of 2021, this year. So what does that mean? Well, that means that a product that was built using those standards, an older version, are basically really only valid to be used up until 7-6-2021. Now, if I, you know, there's a question of, does that mean, does it come out of the manufacturer at that date, and then it's sitting on a distributor's shelf, and then I can use it? There's a lot of debate on all that good stuff. But basically, a manufacturer, if they want it to be in compliance with the European directives, uh, in this case, what we want to do is update our, our declaration of conformity to show that we're actually in conformance with the 2018 version, which is a more recent version. So you can see all this information on the European Journal. They have this for all of the 60079 standards, and they tell you when they go into effect and when they basically expire, if you will. So it's important to understand this and realize this especially if you're a client and you're selecting products, you wanna make sure that the products you're selected are based upon the most relevant and recent standards. Um, and it's important to understand if I'm inspecting EX equipment, is it, what was it, what standard do I need to follow to make sure that I check and do all the references on that product based upon the standard that was in effect at that particular point in time. So this information is readily available. Now, I mentioned a little bit also at the beginning about relevant standards. And, and when we look at certificates, we start seeing uh, references to particular standards. On the right-hand side, we see that we referenced actually in this case, four different standards, the dash zero, the dash 11, the dash 15, and the dash seven. So this is a GMI product, a temperature converter. And GMI has actually tested this to those four different standards. The general standard, the 11 for IS, 15, which is type N protection, and seven for increased safety. So it's important that the manufacturer knows exactly what those standards are. They've tested it to it. And when we look on the left-hand side, we'll see the protection concepts that are built in, in this case, EXEC. We have brackets IAGA, then we have Roman numeral 2C, T4, GC. So that's, that's where we see these standards that are referenced. Again, we notice that we don't see anything about, say, for example, 10-1, which was our area classification standard. We don't see any reference to dash 14, which is our design and installation standard. We don't see anything about dash 17, which is our inspection standard we're seeing standards that reference product certification. So again, as a manufacturer, we need to know dash zero, and then depending on the protection concepts that we're gonna use, we need to understand those standards as well. Now, when we look at an ATEX uh, type examination certificate, notice that we see a very similar type documentation. In this case, however, we see an ENIEC, and so actually in some of these standards in the dash zero from 2018 was actually developed both by Senelec and the IEC at the same time. So there isn't an EN version and an IEC version. There's only one version. Same thing holds true for dash seven. Um, it's a joint standard. So you're gonna see more and more of that. But then you see down below that, you see an EN 600-79-11 and an EN 600-79-15. Notice that those are the relevant standards. The EN standards are the relevant standards that we should be looking for with regards to products that are compliant to the ATEX directive, okay? Sometimes we'll see 
uh, manufacturer's declarations of conformity that'll reference IEC standards. And we don't wanna see that. that. That would be a red flag to me because it really a declaration of conformity, an EU declaration of conformity should be referencing the Euro norm standards, the EN standards, not IEC standards. So the standard format, as I mentioned, four to seven years, it could be five to eight years. So what is actually in the standards? Well, there's obviously the scope, the terms and definitions, the main portion of the standard, um, IP ratings, I'm not sure why I put IP rating on there, that shouldn't be in there. Uh, but then the other thing is annexes within the standard. And these are very important to look at because annexes are very helpful sometimes when you're reading the standards. The normative standard provide additional normative text to the main body of the document. The informative provides additional information intended to assist in the understanding or the use of that document. So if you're reading the standard sometimes and you don't truly quite understand what is in that standard from the basic body or the scope, go into the annexes, look at the informative annex, and in many cases, you'll find something that's more easily understood, if you will. So sometimes people will get in the standards and I know I'll read them and I'm going, what are they saying here? If I go into the annexes, a lot of times I'll find the information there in a much more easy to understand format. Again, the standard format that we follow in the EN standards, it's the same information that we find. It's laid out in the exact same format, except now we do have the Annex ZA, which again, references the relevant IEC to EN standards. And then we'll have additional annexes on compliance to the European market, including the ATEX directive. Other than that, the main base of the standard in the EN standard will be identical to the IEC version. So a little bit about the 80079. Uh, there's actually the, the 79 36 and 37. And I think we had a question from somebody about this um, that wanted to know a little bit more about this. So this was actually uh, a series of standards. Some of you may be familiar with the old Euronorm 13463 set of standards that were developed in the early 2000s. Um, those standards were the first mechanical equipment standards. And really where this came from is people realized in industry that mechanical equipment, well, we've understood that electrical equipment due to heating, arcing and sparking and all of these other things that go on are potential ignition sources. And we're putting these pieces of equipment in a flammable atmosphere and we need to address it in some way, shape or form. A lot of users, a lot of, uh, Customers, a lot of certification people, a lot of technical people, academians were also saying, wait a minute, what about non-electrical equipment? These types of pieces of equipment have been sources, can provide sources of ignition and have actually been, been the root cause of some major industrial disasters uh, due to mechanical failure. So the EN standards were developed and then at some point in time, and it was basically in the mid 2016, 15 timeframe, the IEC along with Senelec came out with the 80079 standards and they were jointly developed in conjunction with the ISO. So these standards do not apply to electrical equipment, but they do apply to mechanical equipment that could be a potential source of ignition while used in a hazardous environment. So here's the, the $64,000 question, so to speak, that people always ask, well, what kind of equipment are we talking about? So I've kind of listed right out of the standard. It could be things like couplings, pumps, gearboxes, brakes, hydraulic pneumatic motors, and any combination of those devices to realize a machine, a fan, an engine, compression, a compressor, or an assembly. So if you think about it, if any of those pieces of equipment potentially doing movement up and down, in, out, rolling, whatever, those are all potential sources of ignition. So they're not the traditional sources that we think of with electrical equipment, but they certainly can be. So what type of equipment or what kind of sources of ignition? 
that we usually are looking at are things like hot surfaces, mechanically generated sparks, could be stray electrical currents, static, lightning, radio frequency. All of these are examples of the types of things that we want to take into account on mechanical equipment being a potential source of these sources of ignition. So here's an example of an IEC EX certificate. Notice in this case, the marking is EXH. So EXH is the general marking requirement for mechanical equipment. And if you're familiar with marking schemes, it's very similar to what we find on electrical. We find the EX, in this case, H, then gas group, T code, so forth and so on. And as we had a question earlier on about dust, that's Roman numeral 3C, so forth and so on. And notice that the relevant standards that we're talking about are the 80079-36 and 37 standards from edition one. So this is a fairly new thing that many people are not aware of. And quite frankly, uh, I did an inspection here for a client that had, <coughs> excuse me, a combination of electrical and mechanical equipment on it. However, the client chose not to address the mechanical equipment because this entire skid package was built before these standards actually were developed. However, I will tell you right now, for future reference, they are going to want the mechanical equipment to have what is called an ignition hazard assessment or possibly actually get fully certified under the IECEX scheme. So this is an important thing for our mechanical friends to pay attention to because this will affect uh, a lot of equipment that's out there. So some of the changes that have come about just in the general uh, things with standards, if you will. If you look at the, the right-hand side, we now see that some of the old legacy markings have changed where EXD, we used to know it as flame proof, is now marked EXDB, EXE is now EB, and so forth and so on. So there have been quite a few changes to some of the IEC standards as well as the EN standards. There was a lot of changes in the 60079-15 standard, which dealt with type N protection. A lot of those concepts were moved to other 60079 standards. There was obviously, as I mentioned, the addition of the mechanical standards. There's also this assembly certification to that technical specification. There's also further integration and reference to other IEC standards, including functional safety. So it's important to understand that the functional safety things, the standards, the 61508 and 61511 standards are now starting to show up in the EX standards and the 60079 standards. And of so, course, wow. there's going to be the introduction of the technical specification personal competency in 2021. The important so, thing to how, how do we, these people make, and you know, just wondering about this mechanical standard, how do we improve? I mean, how can we make a gearbox that is, you know, churning protected yep. from the ignition? What materials? Yep, yep. Let's, let's go to that. I, actually, I think we have it in uh, some of the Q&A. So we'll, okay. we'll get well, it. Well, then we'll answer that later. Yeah, and, and it's a very good point. We have to what what basically you do when you go through that six or eight zero zero seventy nine standard, you have to do what is called an ignition hazard assessment, and in many cases, if it's going into a zone two environment, uh, products that are just have general good reliability uh, are actually suitable for those applications. If it's going into zone one, then we really have to do a lot more detailed information. And we'll talk about this a little bit in the Q&As. All right, great. Well, then okay. let's move on because we are actually. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting 50 down. minutes into our webinar. Yeah. They so, give it cut off 90 minutes. No, no, 90 minutes. <laughs> 75 so, minutes. Some, some of the other standards just to be aware of where the EX information can, can wind up in. If we're doing anything in the uh, offshore markets, the 61892 set of standards Specifically, the dash seven deals with hazardous locations. So there's a lot of reference within that standard of the 60079 standards. 
Uh, the rotating electric machines, our motors, 60034. Uh, within the 60092, if any of you are involved in the LNG market uh, with now fuels for special tankers and ships, uh, that particular standard, the dash 502, deals with hazardous locations, which then goes back to the 60079 standards. Uh, and then, of course, the 60364 series of standards, which deals with general low voltage electrical installations. And of course, there's other specific standards that we all need to be aware of, um, depending on the markets, right? And then many country specific standards are based upon the relevant IEC standards, but may require additional testing and or certification. And we're going to talk about this in the Q&A because there were some questions on this one as well. Well, so here we go. It's another poll. What is the most likely source of ignition with regards to mechanical equipment used in ASLOC? It is a multiple choice, but talking to Bob earlier, I understand there is a most correct answer, although. Yeah, there, there's no wrong answer here. Um, but what is what you would think of those five? What would be the most logical one that would actually be the source of ignition with regards to mechanical equipment? So we got electrical spark, hot surfaces, static, mechanical generator spark, or isothermic reaction. There was a question by isothermic reaction. So how can we check that? Yeah, yeah. well, that, yeah, that's a... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... Anyhow, uh, yeah. <laughs> today, <laughs> you know, what I've noticed today is that uh, our participants, are almost all of them are answering the poll. You know, sometimes we got 60 yeah. 70% of the people participating today, we have almost everyone yeah. clicking in. Of course, guys, you know, there's no judging here. We just uh, no, we, we just trying laugh. to make it more interesting. <laughs> and I see, you know, the answer coming in. You don't see them yet, but I see them and they are everywhere. So yeah. let, let me see if uh, the, what Bob said would be the most what correct answer. Think? Yeah, what I'm do you think first? I yeah. It so is follow not what, first right now, but we <laughs> follow follow. What would you think would be the most logical one of those five? Well, I, you know, I was thinking the mechanical. I mean, it's just you know, turning a, a gear, this spinning will make some you know some yeah. metal spark stuff like that. Mechanical and of course, odd surfaces because at the same time, if there is friction. Yep, friction, mechanically generated sparks, and friction. Uh, bearings, those are the most logical, most common potential sources of ignition. And this is what you guys answered. So great job. Yep. Well done. Well done. Well done. So uh, we, we have this. This is the only, just my little note here. Um, just because standards are important, they're not the whole story. Remember, regulators' acceptance of standards is just important, is not more so. Uh, Remember that some standards are more geared towards the manufacturing, other standards are geared more towards the designer end users. Here's the important thing, confirm whatever you're using, is that the most up-to-date or relevant for your application? Don't forget about the mechanical standards. And if you have any questions, right, don't guess, <laughs> don't assume, <laughs> refer to the standards. And if you still are confused, reach out, you know, talk to people, Talk to us, talk to whomever, ask questions because you don't want to make any assumptions with regards to EX. You are correct, Bob. So here we have the closing. So you have our contact details. So now we'll get to the question and answer presentation. Let me share that if I can manage today. Shut the questions here for a second. While you're doing that, um, Rob asked a question, has EXNR gone to EXPX and why? Uh, no, EXNR is actually one of the few standards or one of the protection concepts that still exist in the Dash 15 standard. The 60079 standards, 60079-15 was the type N protection concepts. And most of those were moved out of them with the exception of EXNR. So that's still within the Dash 15, and it is still a valid standard. It will actually be now marked EXNRC, small c. 
Okay, great. Well, let's get to some question. And then uh, there's also a question about temperature. We'll get to that also. So let me see if I can move. You, you see the presentation, right? I see it. Yep. What would be some typical example of mechanical EX equipment? So, so well, well, these are, they could be things like fans, could be bearings, could be rollers. We, we talked a little bit about this. Anything moving, but, basically. Yeah, something that's rotating, moving, um, you know, and it's, and again, it's going to be potentially generating electrical heat or sparks, mechanical sparks. It could be from bearing overheating, ignition created by the normal function of the machine. So one of the protection concepts that we actually use for say a rotating bearing or something that overheats, we could put temperature probes on this particular piece of equipment that once it gets to a certain temperature, it cuts it off, right? Same thing with a motor overload relay that we're doing with motors under a locked rotor condition. Mm -hmm. We could be doing the same type of concept with mechanical equipment. So things that have bearings, things that have rotating types of equipment are, are really common in, in um, really the items that we need to consider. And what we see down there with that nameplate, you can see that again, there's the EXH, and you see all of the gas groups, you see the T codes, you see all of the relevant information, both under ATEX as well as IECEX. Okay, let's see the next question, Bob. Okay. Are there equivalent Russian norm to IEC standard? I believe so, because we do have certification right. <laughs> for Russian standards. Yes. So they, they used to be the, um, I think it was the 51399 standards, but they have been updated to the 31510 standards. And I, you probably really can't see this, but on the right-hand side, that is, uh, that is, if I'm not mistaken, well, I can't read Russian, but I will tell you that is, that is the Russian equivalent to the 60079-10-1 which is your area classification, um, explosive gas atmospheres. So the Russian standards, the, the GAUS standards, if you will, are basically very similar to the IEC standards or EN standards. Um, however, it's, it, it is important to note that if you wanna import into the Russian uh, Federation, there is a requirement for additional certification. Generally, it's, it's not a technical issue it's more of a commercial issue. And it's, it's things like you have to do marking on the equipment, both in, uh, well, you have to do it in Russian and various other things. Yeah, well, they have to, you have to have a station manual in Russian. Um, and now it is called EAC standard. So they are a harmonized standard for uh, Belarus, Russia, Belarus. and Kazakhstan. Yeah. And you need to get their certificate if you want to import. Yep. Uh, and to get a certificate, it is the standard the same. It's, you would say it's paperwork, but there are two requirements. They have inspection of the factory, and also you need an applicant. You need somebody in Russia that is a Russian entity that uh, guarantees your uh, product. So when they import it, somebody has to be responsible for it. So you need a so-called applicant. So if you don't yeah. have a subsidiary there or you don't have a partner, it, it becomes a little complicated. Uh, and also to, to be noted, Bob, that there are um, standards that are uh, related to product that uh, measure. So like an analog barrier, there are other standards you have to comply to other than sure. the EX standards, right. which can be even more complex to obtain because they basically test every single product that comes in, you know. Right, right. Okay. What about other words then? Well, there are many, if I remember correct. This is one of the problem in this. Yeah. We have the IC standard supposed to be the global standard, but then. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, you know, the whole intent of the IEC was to have one world, one standard, everybody adopts it and accepts it. And it's it sounds great in practice or in theory, but of course you know money takes over and everybody wants to get a piece of the pie. So yes, I mean for the most part, if you follow the base IEC standard, that is the basis for many different Haslock standards around the world. 
So in the US, for example, we adopted as the UL version of 60079 and the 80079. Canada does the same thing. Brazil, they call them the NBR IEC standards. Australia, New Zealand calls the ASNZS standards and others. Now, just because you have an IEC certification doesn't necessarily mean that you can automatically just say, well, I meet these requirements in other parts of the world. For example, in the UL in the, in the United States, there's additional requirements that a product would actually have to go under and get tested to, such as fire and shock hazard that are outside of the IEC standards that are incorporated into the UL standards. But there's nothing as far as the definition of a flame proof product in the UL standard versus a flame proof product based upon the IEC standard or an EN standard, it's basically the same. Yeah. And that's so it, it one, is one standard no. that differs uh, somewhat is the Japanese standard. And yes. uh, they, they, they are very, it is, uh, you know, quite uh, complex to obtain. They follow their, they have their own interpretation of these IC, IEC standards. The right. standard base is the same, but they interpret it in a very different way. As we say in Italian, alla lettera to the single word, you know, like when you read the Bible in the incorrect way, you know, and you take every single word in the contest or out of contest. So it, it, it's quite complex. And uh, CCC is a requirement for China. We, GMI has obtained CCC for all that product. It was started to be mandated, uh, I believe in January, 2021 or at the end of 2021, pretty, don't remember, but we do have it. You know, they, they, the, it seems that instead of the world becoming an harmonized place, we are splitting and dividing a new standard pops up. The latest is the UK. Now you have to recertify to UK standard because they are out of the EU. We have investigated. We have until the end of uh, 2022, I believe. Yeah. And then you will be required to have a certified body in the UK issue a new certificate according to the same as a standard. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that is practice for us. All right, Bob, let me see if there's another question here. I don't know if there was anything. No, no. there was not, but we have a question. Um, there was interesting question about temperature. We do sell in the Middle East a lot. And the question is, you know, in the Middle East gets very hot and the, normally temperature can go up to 55. Then you have black body radiation and the, the temperature can get very hot. And we know because we have some installation in the desert and the product are cooking in there. They say 55 is actually 80 or 90 degrees. Right, um, right. This was uh, actually, uh, this was a, a great, we had this question, a similar question to this actually on the last, uh, and, and I've been trying to actually find the answer to that to tell you what is it, uh, what should you actually be looking for for something above say 55 or 65 or something like that. I, uh, Mustafa, I will reach out to you and I will, uh, I will, I will see if I can find some additional information and send it your way. So, yeah. but basically, you know, this is what we sustain. If you have a GMI product tested 70, certified up to 70 degrees, you can run them at 100, they will work. But the certificate says that if the ambient temperature or so the temperature that surrounds the product goes above 70, well, then you're no longer can no longer right. guarantee that, you know, the, the device will do its job. Right. Uh, yeah. Now we're trying to go 80, but it's not easy because, you know, the, you, everybody's asking for smaller and smaller and smaller products. <laughs> and then the room to dissipate heat gets smaller and smaller. Right. Okay. How about a solenoid valve? Solenoid valve requires EXH? I, I have not seen that. I've seen solenoid valves that are encapsulated. I've seen solenoid valves that are EXD. Uh, but mechanical mm -hmm. valves, you know, a solenoid valve, if you will, I haven't seen that actually fall underneath the scope. Now, I'm not yeah, saying it does, it doesn't, but I haven't seen it. Um, so I would say right now, probably do a little bit more research on that one. Um, oh. the, well, there's okay, one guys. last question that we have. Yeah, a, an EXE certified panel, we should only use EXE and EXD certified components or normal com components can be used. In an EXE panel, we must use uh, EXE or we must use certified components on the inside of an EXE panel because an EXE box is nothing more than a sheet metal 
or sheet plastic type enclosure. So the types of equipment that we put on the inside of an EXE panel must be certified equipment. On the other hand, if we have an EXD panel, then we can use general purpose equipment on the inside of an EXD panel and use it safely. Well, okay, so guys, we do get a lot of questions sometimes, the same question do about functional safety or about uh, safety relays, other type. We have a lot of type of, you have webinars covering many subjects, so you just can look them up, our schedule online, and we also record all our webinars and they are posted in our YouTube channel, so you can go back and review them. We will share these uh, to the participants of this webinar, the slides for these webinars. And uh, let me launch the last poll here to see how we did. There is one more question here, let me see. Have you ever got into debate about the, oh, the question is gone. Oh, I just, yeah, the debate <laughs> on if a product is installed into a uh, zone zero, but yet, uh, well, I need to. Uh, yeah, well, you, I don't know what you did, but you click on the answer and the Yeah, the, the debate about, say, a sensor being in a zone one or zone zero, but the device being outside in a zone one or a zone two. Um, I'm, I'm not sure on that question specifically, but if a sensor is being located in a zone one or a zone zero environment, and yet the device being outside in a zone one, I'm not sure how, if I'm, I don't know your question. <laughs> anyway, you drop, drop this. We will drop. read the question with, uh, a little bit and maybe, you know, we calm and answer that later. So let me show you, I, I show you the result yet or not? Oh no, I need to end the poll. Otherwise I cannot share the result. Share with the result. Uh, like in a tank, the question was about, uh, okay. Well, we will get to this question with an email to you guys. Uh, thank you again. Uh, stop, close. Thank you, Bob. As usual, you know, subjects are always interesting. Well, you're gonna have coffee before you go to bed. That's a bad yeah, idea. Yeah, I started thinking about that. I, I had to drink some coffee to stay awake, but now I'm, you know, it's, it's 1 10 in the morning. So I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna be, sitting there in bed with my eyes wide open so yeah anyway. well thanks thanks bob really really enjoyed and thank you guys for being with us and uh, we'll meet again sometime soon yes thank you all everybody good night bob good night cheers cheers